that, in that case, uh, the quantity that's provided to people, conditional on them going to Disneyland at all, is efficient. Despite the fact that the firm would like to price discriminate, the best thing that they can do is just um, charge a price up front and then allow people to have efficient access to all those services. Now, a less extreme form of this is called bundling. So it may not always be that you want to um, completely offer everything free on the margin, but you might offer a cheaper price for buying things together than buying them separately. If it's the case that most people um, sort of value one of the goods but not the other, and you don't know which one, which person values more, um, but you do know that sort of the total value that everyone has for the package is likely to be close to something. So if that's the case, then it makes a lot of sense to put the goods together and charge whatever you know people are willing to pay for the package, because otherwise you're going to end up like you know trying to charge a price that's in between for each of the individual goods, right? And then some people will end up not buying it, and other people will end up paying less than it's really worth to them, right? If you can, by putting things together, get a better sense of how much people are willing to pay for the you know, group of things than they are individually, you can actually use that roughly as a form of price discrimination. But that's actually efficient because you're giving people access to both of the goods uh, for, a, for basically an upfront price. So one example that's often given of this is the fact that it's much cheaper to buy Excel and Word and the whole Microsoft Office package together than to buy the individual components separately. And the idea behind that is that some people might be more people who like Excel, some people might be people who more like Word, but um, that sort of the willingness to pay for the whole package is more predictable for Microsoft and therefore they bundle them together. Um, okay. This is in many ways similar to bundling, um, sorry, bundling is in many ways similar to quality or quantity discount, but here you're sort of putting together different types of goods rather than just an overall uh, quality. Okay. So other for forms of price discrimination can, are sort of less efficient or perfect than this. So one form is loyalty discounts that we were talking about before. Um, another version is what's called sort of intertemporal price discrimination or sales. This is the idea that a department store might um, want to offer a low price to the people who are only willing to pay that low price, but they don't want to just offer a low price to everybody because there's lots of people who are like, oh, I need to go get a code and I don't care what I pay for it, and you want to charge a lot to those people. So the way that you do that is you have like a sale rack with old stuff or you have a occasional sales and so the people who like can't wait for the sale will pay the higher price and the people who can wait for the sale will pay the lower price or you might charge a lower price on um, you might charge a lower price at Christmas time because Christmas time is incredibly busy and like people who are wealthy don't want to go and like have to deal with the hassle of being in this incredibly busy mall and waiting in long lines and so you know that the people who are willing to put up with all that stuff um, are going to uh, be willing to pay less, right? And so you want to charge them a lower price, right? Um, airlines and hotels do something similar, which is that um, if the hotel, like most business travelers don't know way in advance, but also know at least somewhat in advance whether they're going to travel or not, right? And so those people are the ones who are willing to pay the most. And so often you see this inverted U shape of the prices on airlines or hotels. Because the, um, the business travelers can't wait till the last minute for a deal to decide whether they're going to go or not. They have to go. So prices go down at the end for people who can wait and sort of have be uncertain till the end about whether they're going to go or not. On the other hand, uh, people who are willing to book a long time in advance can also get a discount because the business travelers usually don't know that long in advance whether they're going or not. Um, another form of this is to sort of have what, what I would call add-ons or obfuscation, where you um, sort of hide some of the uh, 
hint a special cost of the product in order to try to charge a higher price to people who don't understand the extra price that they're going to be paying, right? So for example, hotels are often um, cheap, but then they have these mini bars and other accessories that are really, really expensive. Or printers uh, often are relatively cheap, but then the ink cartridges are really expensive. And that's a way of sort of selectively targeting higher prices at people who are bad at figuring out all those extra details, right? Um, and uh, it allows discrimination against people who sort of don't read the small print, right? Now, um, one of my favorite examples of this sort of um, pricing comes from Les Miserables, which was a, uh, a famous book by Victor Hugo and then was turned into a musical. And what? And now a movie. When does it come out? Christmas? Yeah, I think it comes out at Christmas. Anyways, it looks like it's going to be a really beautiful movie that they're making out of it. But um, the innkeeper in it is sort of like this jerk, and he has a song where he describes uh, his pricing uh, strategy. And I'm going to play that for you guys. Um, So um, some of these practices, some things that look like price discrimination, can be explained by costs. So for example, um, if I am a movie theater and I charge a high price for um, going to movies on like a Saturday night, that might seem to some extent to be price discrimination, but it's not exactly necessarily price discrimination because the chances that a movie sells out on Saturday night and therefore the opportunity cost of you going to that movie is higher on a Saturday night than it is, on a, um, than it is on a, in the middle of the week. And so changes in prices across the week might not actually be price discrimination. Um, they might be, but they might actually just be the firm, uh, the fact that the firm's costs are changing. Another example of that is electricity prices are usually much higher in the middle of the day because um, that's when there's the peak of the demand for electricity and they have to raise the price because otherwise the, um, the demand would be too high uh, and the system couldn't bear it, right? So um, another example is that sometimes you might, it might be cheaper to sell Microsoft Word and Microsoft Excel together in one package because you don't have to pay for printing you know, multiple CDs. You could just sell one CD, right? And so that's a purely cost-based reason to sell in bundles. Some populations of people might actually be cheaper to serve than other people are, right? So different people might pay different prices to get insurance, not because of price discrimination, but just because the cost of serving those two different people is different, right? Um, or senior citizens might get a discount on tickets at the theater just because they're less likely to make uh, you know, cell phone calls in the middle of the movie or talk to their friends uh, than our younger people, right? Um, so the question is then what exactly does it mean for something to be price discrimination rather than uh, cost-based 
uh, variable pricing. Can anyone try to explain that? Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, it seems like price discrimination is the change in prices based more on demand rather than cost. Yeah, that's right. Remind me of your name? George. George. Um, that's right. Um, you can think of um, uh, when different prices reflect willingness of consumers to pay rather than the cost of the firm of producing it, that's the case when you can think of it as being price discrimination. This is the sort of thing which would never happen in a competitive market, whereas actually efficient price variation, uh, you know, peak load pricing, etc., is more likely to happen in a competitive market than not. And in fact, there's cases when the failure of prices to respond to differences in conditions can itself constitute a form of price discrimination. Because if the demand doesn't vary, but the costs do vary, um, then you, uh, the failure to change prices in those cases is actually an indicator that you're discriminating uh, effectively rather than responding to prices. OK. So um, another imperfect approach to price discrimination is to group people together using some objective characteristic um, and to charge people uh, with these characteristics different prices, right? And this is very common in entertainment and transportation. Do, do people want to give some examples of that? Uh, yeah, Matt, Sol uh, King Solomon. A lot of seniors <laughs> get like discount cards and students get discount cards uh, for yeah. buses and subways. Yeah, that's right. Um, also, Libraries often have to pay more to have a journal than do individual people because they're going to be consumed by a large number of people and therefore they're going to be willing to pay a lot more. Uh, you can often get a discount in some areas for being a public servant or an educator. And in fact, this is a total ripoff because at a lot of like gyms in Chicago, I can get like some really low price because I'm like, you know, a public school teacher or something like that, even though I just qualify under their educator discount, and I'm a professor, right? Um, prescription drugs are priced differently in the developing world than they are in the developed world. Home, there are different prices for home and office use of um, uh, software often. And there are lots of cases when uh, uh, various social programs are targeted at different groups based on objective characteristics that are hard for people to change, like giving benefits to people who are unemployed rather than just people who are poor for whatever reason because it might be hard to change your unemployment status. Or targeting um, money to, uh, well, giving taxes based on people's height, which is something that some people have proposed because that's not as easy to change as it is to change your income. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about redistribution next week. Um, another uh, example is resident versus tourist pricing in like museums, right? Often, if you're a resident of a city, they'll charge you a lower price than if you're a tourist, because tourists are usually willing to pay a lot to go to the museum, and residents are like, well, I could do that, or I could do a zillion other things that day, right? Uh, another example of this is that often um, restaurants in Chinatown will have a Chinese language menu where the prices are like half as high <laughs> as they are on the English language menu. And that's a way of like targeting discounts at Chinese people, right? OK. Um, <laughs> so um, let's do a mathematical, simple mathematical example of this. So we can talk of there being two types of markets, a strong and a weak market. The strong market is the one where you want to charge a high price, where the demand is high. And the weak market is the one where you want to charge a low price. So a simple example of that would be that um, the quantity in the strong market is 1 minus the price